Unleavened Bread Ministries presents Panoramic Bible Studies with David Eels. Let's go to the Lord and ask for His mercy and grace upon us today and um, that His anointing would be with me. You know, the Lord chooses um, weak vessels in order to prove His power. And um, that's why I know I'm qualified. (laughs) Thank you, Father. Father, we thank You in Jesus' name for this fellowship with the brethren, Lord. I ask you, Lord, that you would uh, use the words today, Lord, that you would anoint the words, that they would be your words, Lord, that they would go forth and touch hearts and minds and um, bring forth your power in them, your rest, your peace in the brethren, uh, your encouragement to holiness and righteousness and truth. Lord, we thank you that uh, we know we can do nothing without you, but we can do all things through you. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you for being our Savior. We thank you for being our provider in all things. And we thank you that that we don't have to live this Christian life, that, that you will do it in us. And we just receive this as a great blessing from you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, brethren, I want to share something I think is very, very important. I wish that all of God's people would understand this. It would put faith in their heart. It would put the fear of God in them. It would cause many of God's people who have been living under the traditions of men and basically living their own life instead of the life of a disciple um, to feel responsible to take the Word of God and, and, um, and walk as disciples of Jesus Christ. I'll share a verse with you. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14. It says, Follow after peace with all men and the sanctification without which no man shall see the Lord. The sanctification without which no man shall see the Lord. Multitudes of Christians, just about any kind of Christian you can think of, walking in any way they want to walk are considering that they're about to see the Lord, but but what is this walking in sanctification? Well, I'll point out to you that it is the word hagiosmos, and it uh, is the same exact word for holiness in the Scriptures. You probably will find sometimes your Bible says holiness, and sometimes it says sanctification. If you really want to uh, do a, a decent study of this, you'll have to look up both words. I'm going to say it right now. Um, because they are both exactly the same word. Um, in my association with different religious people, there is a, a section of Christianity that believes that um, sanctification is something that um, is a progressive. It's uh, an experiential walk with the Lord. It grows as you grow. There's another group that believes that sanctification is a experience, a one-time experience, that once you get it, you got it, you know. <laughs> I'm not in that group. I don't believe that for a minute because I know what the Scripture says. Their particular doctrine um, separates holiness and sanctification. They consider those two different operatings of the Spirit of God. However, it is the exact same Greek word, so that could not be. It was just kind of up to the translators to translate it however they felt it sounded right and according to their doctrine. But the truth is, they're both the exact, have the exact same meaning. And it means um, separation from sin unto God, separation from the world unto God. And uh, as saints, the word saint. Um, comes from the same word, hagios. Hagios. It means uh, the sanctified ones or the holy ones. And uh, as we search the scriptures, we begin to see that there's two different manifestations of sanctification or holiness. And uh, one of them is by faith and the other is by manifestation. And if we get them mixed up, 
it can cause a doctrine that basically is, um, let me say, does not exhort the people of God to holiness and uh, makes people to rest in their flesh rather than um, rest in the spirit. Uh, but I would like to look at the, the faith uh, meaning for um, sanctification or holiness first, and then maybe we'll look at the, the manifestation part of it. Um, in chapter 10 of Hebrews, we see some very good news. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 10. Most people understand this to mean uh, manifestation. When it's really not talking about manifestation, it's talking about faith. What we have in Christ by faith is not necessarily what we have by manifestation. And uh, what we have by faith, if we walk in that faith, it will be manifest. That's God's way. Um, Hebrews 10 and 10 says, By which will we have been sanctified, or made holy, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Wow. We, now, most people believe that um, this is manifestly true when they come to the Lord. But that's a lie. It actually is true in spiritual realm in heavenly places in Christ Jesus because he's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus but how many of you know that we have to abide in Christ to manifest those things now we do have this by faith by faith we call the things that be not as though they were we don't look at ourselves we look at Christ we look at what he did at the cross we know that he uh, finished the good work he started in us we know that, um, according to this, we're sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once and for all. And verse 14 says, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Now, we know that what Jesus did at the cross in sanctifying us, in separating us from the world unto God, means the same thing as perfection. Uh, we're delivered from the curse. We're delivered from the power of sin. We now abide in him by faith. But if you understand that faith calls the things that be not as though they were, when he says by faith here, we're accepting something that we don't yet see fully manifested. And um, this is the key, because when we believe what God's promises say, he is going to bring it to pass. By one offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. And we, as we walk by faith in what the Lord has accomplished for us at the cross, the Lord is going to bring us into it. If we believe that by mental assent this already happened for us, it's already manifested for us, and all we have to do now is sit down on a pew and wait for the Lord to come and rapture us out of this, this life, that's a strong delusion. Uh, I would like to, before I get away from this point, I want to point out to you that uh, we're justified by faith. Uh, faith is accounted as righteousness. When you believe what God says, even though it's not manifested, it is accounted as righteousness. But also, when you believe what God says, it doesn't stop there because when you believe what God says, He manifests it. Anything you believe that God says, he will bring it to pass. Mental assent is in most of Christians. And uh, many believe that they can walk any kind of way they want to walk because they were sanctified and they were holy and they were made perfect at the cross. Well, that's a lie. And before I get away from this text, I want to point this out to you in verse 26. It says, For if we sin willfully after that we've received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more a sacrifice for sins. Wow. Willful rebellion, as Numbers called it, sinning with a high hand, you know. And he said those people will be cut off from among Israel. Willful rebellion has no sacrifice. The sacrifice we just read about, the sanctification, the perfection. Um, verse 27, 
but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and a fierceness of fire which shall devour the adversaries. A man that has set it not, Moses' law dieth without compassion on the word of two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment think ye shall he be judged worthy who hath trodden under foot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. So, they've looked with little esteem upon the sanctification that the Lord gave them, and because that's true, God says there is no covering for their sins. They, are, they, have, uh, they have no sacrifice. The sacrifice, of course, is how we receive sanctification or holiness. So, for those people who think they can do anything they want to do, they have bought the strong delusion. We are disciples of Jesus Christ. We walk by faith. We accept what he did for us. Look in Romans chapter 6. And I'm going to read verse 22, and then I'm going to explain it. It says, But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto sanctification and the end eternal life. We need fruit unto sanctification to have eternal life. If you remember, Jesus in the parable of the sower mentioned four different people that um, represented... Um, Bad ground, um, rocky ground, and only one of those groups bought forth fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold, the one that entered the kingdom. So all of those groups heard the word and received it, but only one of them bore fruit. He says here that being made free from sin and become service to God, we have our fruit unto sanctification and the end eternal life. But what is he talking about? Uh, the Lord has already given us the fruit of sanctification. He did it through what Jesus did at the cross, and he does it through our faith that unites us with what Jesus did at the cross. The whole text of Romans chapter 6 speaks of this. Let me just back up just a little bit. Verse 3, Or are you ignorant that all we who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him through baptism into death, that like as Jesus was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we also might walk in newness of life. How do we walk in newness of life? We accept the death of this old life because we're united with him in baptism. We go down in the water, the old man's dead. We accept it by faith. Baptism, of course, uh, helps us to accept it by faith because we're doing something we can see and we can feel and it engages our imagination a little more and we're accepting that when we go down that old man's dead and when we come up it's no longer I that live it's Christ that liveth in me that's basically what Paul said well this is really good news when we come up we're new creatures old things have passed away all things have become new we accept by faith the fullness of our salvation, not just what we can see. You know, when you walk into the kingdom and you get a new spirit, you're sometimes tempted to think, and uh, people around you, and even preachers will tell you, you got all you're ever going to get. What a big lie. You've just received a new spirit. Now you need a new soul, new thinking. And the Lord is quite willing to do that, but we have to see the end from the beginning. We're sons of God now. We have to walk as sons of God. We walk in the kingdom. We don't walk in the kingdom of this world. We have to learn to walk in the kingdom by faith. We see the end from the beginning. We call the things that be not as though they were. We accept the fullness of God's salvation from the very beginning. We accept it as a done deal. And uh, baptism is a method by which we enter into this by faith. The Bible says in verse 5, For if we become united with him in the likeness of his death, we shall also be of the resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away, 
so that we should no longer be in bondage to sin. Why do you get baptized? Because you're accepting by faith that the old man who sins is now dead and gone, and the one who lives in you is Jesus Christ. And verse 10, For the death that he died, he died unto sin once, but the life that he liveth, liveth unto God. Verse 11, Even so, reckon ye yourselves to be dead unto sin, but alive unto God in Christ Jesus. So when we say we're saved, this is what we're doing. We're believing that we have the completeness of our salvation. We're believing and we're reckoning that we are dead to sin, but alive unto God in Jesus Christ. That's faith. That's how faith works. That's what he's talking about in verse 22, that you being made free from sin. Paul hadn't stumbled upon the first sinless people on earth. He was talking faith, and he was teaching us how to receive things by faith. Verse 12 says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey the lusts thereof. In other words, in this way, therefore, in this way, let not sin reign in your mortal body. When you reckon yourself to be dead unto sin, God is the one that empowers you to walk away from sin. And he tells us, this is the way that you don't let sin reign in your body. Now, I'm going to skip on down a little bit because I can't afford to spend too much time here at this one spot. Verse 17, But thanks be to God that whereas you were servants of sin, remember this, you were servants of sin, not are. You're not a sinner saved by grace. You were a sinner, and now you're saved by grace. That's a difference, a big difference. Okay? You were servants of sin. You became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching whereunto you were delivered. And being made free from sin. Why are we made free from sin? Because the man who sins died. He died at the cross, and we exercised our faith at baptism. He is dead. He is gone. He cannot tempt us anymore. We walk by faith and not by sight. And uh, verse Let's see, verse um, 20. For when you were servants of sin, you were free in regard of righteousness. What fruit then had ye at that time in the things whereof you're now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto sanctification, and the end, eternal life. So, you see, once again, We're talking about receiving this by faith. This still does not have anything to do with the manifestation, but it has to do with receiving this gift from God by faith. Acts 26 and uh, verse, uh, let's see. This is the story of um, when Saul met the Lord on the Damascus Road and the Lord spoke to him. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Verse 16, But arise and stand upon thy feet, for this end have I appeared unto thee, to appoint thee a minister and a witness both of the things wherein thou hast seen me and of the things wherein I uh, will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I will send thee, to open their eyes that they may turn from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive remission of sins and inheritance among them that are sanctified by faith in me. Inheritance among them that are sanctified by faith in me. The process of sanctification comes to pass by our faith in him. And that's why we preach the gospel, the good news. Um, There's a lot of antichrist gospel going on out there. Um, It doesn't sanctify people because they see no need. They think that all they ever are going to receive of sanctification, they received it when they got saved. So they sit on a pew and warm it until they think they're going to be raptured. But without sanctification... The Bible says, no man shall see the Lord. We need to hold fast to the word, folks. 
1 uh, Corinthians chapter 6 and uh, verse 7. This confession of our faith, this holding fast to our faith, will deliver us from the power of sin, just as we saw there in Romans. It says, Nay, already it's altogether a defect in you that you have lawsuits one with another. Why not rather take the wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? Nay, but you defraud... You have to excuse me, my Bible is kind of faded out here. <laughs> you defraud yourselves and, and uh, do wrong and defraud, and that's your brother. I know that the unrighteous, excuse me, or know you not, that the righteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, excuse me a minute. I'm going to get my other Bible here. Just a minute. This Bible is so old, folks. I love it so much, but it's kind of old. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Or know ye not that the righteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with men, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Well, folks, there are a lot of people deceived in this regard because they really think that they can walk in these willful rebellions and that they're under the blood of Jesus. And uh, that's a strong delusion. And here's the point. He says in verse 11, And such were some of you. Obviously, he's rebuking people that are doing this at the time. But he says, Such were some of you. But you were washed. See, there's no reason for us to live under the bondage of sin anymore. We just discovered that by faith we've been delivered of the power of sin. And, uh, and this is what he's reminding them of. You know, first he started out talking to them about um, defrauding their brother through lawsuits and whatever, you know. And he said, just, just take the wrong, okay. And then he gives a list of other things that, um, that by the way, uh, believers are caught up into even in our day. Uh, rebellion against the Word of God in willful outward immorality. And yet they think that it's all covered by the blood of Jesus. But we saw in Hebrews 10, 10 26 that that's not so. And they, he reminds them, And such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified. We were sanctified when we came to the Lord. We accepted the fullness of our sanctification. You were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. What we accepted at the cross is what we're supposed to be holding fast to now. See, some people say or think that um, they're in bondage to sin. But by one offering, he hath perfected them that are sanctified. By that one offering, he both sanctified and perfected us. And since this is so, we're not in bondage to sin anymore. We don't. If you're convinced that you are in bondage to sin, then you are. Because be it unto you according to your faith. Multitudes are convinced of this, that they have no hope. Until the time when they're raptured away or when they die, they have no hope of being delivered from the power of sin. But we just saw in Romans 6, but that's not so. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. What we accept by faith, God plans to bring to pass. Okay? Look at um, Ephesians 5. I'd like to talk to you about this manifestation uh, just a little bit. Ephesians 5, verse 25. It's, it's as important to know that we have not manifested it as it is to know that we receive it by faith. Because some people believe they manifested all they're ever going to get when they got saved. That somehow God just doesn't hold their sin against them anymore. But, but that's not God's purpose. Or not, it's not his point. Um, you know, faith is just a means to an end. It's not the end in itself. 
Faith is believing for something so that you receive it. And um, baptism, of course, helps our faith to receive what God has done for us. Total eradication of the old man and resurrection of the new man. Okay, Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for it, that he might sanctify it, that he might sanctify it. The Lord is interested in sanctifying what? The church. Well, now, wait a minute. They were sanctified. Yes, but they need to be sanctified. They were sanctified by faith, but they need to be sanctified by manifestation. That's where the fruit is born, folks. What we received in the Spirit must be manifested in our soul, that he might sanctify it, having cleansed it with the washing of water with the word. Well, now you understand that what we receive by baptism, by faith, in the washing of the word, is fulfilled as we continue to walk in this life, humbling ourselves to the word of God, repenting to the word of God, um, the Bible says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, which is with the Word of God. What we received by faith, we have to be eagerly looking forward to manifesting. Okay? Having cleansed it with the washing of the water with the Word, that he might present the church to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish, that it should be holy and without blemish. This is the purpose of God, the manifestation of holiness. The word holy here, same thing as sanctify, same word, that it should be holy and without blemish. So you can see here that what some think is, um, is a faith, only a faith thing, that, um, that they believed by faith that they were sanctified, and so that's all God's interested in. But now we see here that it's God's purpose and His desire, and not at all certain, by the way. It says might, you understand, because it is certain that God will sanctify a church through their faith, but it's not certain that every individual member of that church will walk by faith and see that manifestation. Nor is it at all certain that every member of that church will walk by faith and manifest being the bride, which is what he's talking about here. It's not at all certain. Uh, what's it going to be with you? This is the point. Manifestation is the reason you believe for something, is to see it. Uh, many people believe that they will never see it in this life. That's the Antichrist gospel. Exactly. They believe that they're always going to be in bondage to sin, contrary to what we just read. But that's the Antichrist gospel. Manifestation is the whole reason. Uh, 2 Corinthians 7 and 1, these promises that we've looked at are for the purpose of giving us authority over sin, over corruption, over this fallen estate. In 2 Corinthians 7 and 1, it says, having therefore these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. See, I thought we were waiting on God, right? Well, if you have a promise that you've been delivered out of the power of darkness, Colossians 1 and 13, that you've been made free from sin, Romans chapter 6, that you've been delivered from the curse, Galatians chapter 3, when you have these kind of promises... They're like a sword that we can use against our enemies. Now, God didn't tell the Israelites, don't worry about it. You don't have to go in there. I'll knock them all dead before you go in there. No, he said, you take up your sword and I will be with you. And, of course, that's exactly what's happening with us. We're going into our promised land. We're putting to death the old man by the edge of the sword. What, what is the sword? The two-edged sword of the Word of God, Hebrews 4.12. It is the promises. Since God says it's so, it's so. We have victory over this old man. He was crucified at the cross. And now we have authority. 
Having therefore these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement, all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness. There's the word, sanctification, same word, in the fear of God. This is the same word, but it's a slightly different word. This is the word hagiosune. And what it means is the manifestation of sanctification in a person's walk. The manifestation of sanctification. It's a slightly different word. It's only used a few times in the scriptures, but God wanted to make sure we understood what he's talking about here. Now, the people he's speaking to here are all Christians. And he says, for instance, back in verse 17, chapter 6 and verse 17, he says, Come out from among them and be separate. Separate is what the word sanctification means. Separate from the world, separated unto God. That's what it means. Separate from sin, separated unto God. Okay. Come ye out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch no unclean thing, especially a dead man, right? Remember the... the um, commands in the Old Testament that you were defiled if you touched a dead man? Well, that's because we're supposed to be separate from the dead man. The old man who's dead, who died at the cross. Don't touch him. He's unclean. Don't listen to him. Don't follow him. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you and I will be to you a father and you shall be to me sons and daughters. Separation, sanctification is necessary for sonship. To be manifested in us. So the demand is hagiosune, perfecting holiness, the fulfillment of holiness here, the manifestation of holiness here, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So in this life, we have been given the authority through these promises that say we're delivered from sin. Jesus lives in us. We're made free from sin. These give us a sword to come against the enemy and the flesh and say, No, I don't have to serve you. I will not serve you. This is the word of the Lord. Now we're talking about manifestation. Okay. Many of God's people are just not motivated. They like to live where they are. They don't. They like an excuse to live where they are. So they listen to ear tickling doctrines that permit them to live like they are and fly away. And when they're through, live in their lustful life. So what does God do? Well, he he chastens. They may not understand that. Many of them think that this is the normal Christian life: is to live under chastening all of your life, live under the curse all of your life. Not so. He chastens. He chastens to motivate us to holiness and to, and, uh, to fear God. Uh, back in Hebrews chapter 12, where we started, I'm going to go back a little bit and read uh, verse 6 on down. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son he receiveth. It is for chastening that you endure. God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father chasteneth not? But if you are without chastening, whereof we have all been made partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we had our fathers, had the fathers of our flesh to chasten us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed good unto them. But he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness or sanctification. We get chastened, folks, to motivate us to holiness, to cause us to have the fear of God to depart from evil, the Bible says. Fear God and depart from evil. Chastening restores the fear of God. It motivates us to find out, Lord, how am I offending you? I do not want to live under this any longer. I do not want your chastening. So sometimes he has to motivate us like that and restore that fear. Verse 11, All chastening seemeth for the present 
to be not joyous but grievous, yet afterward it yieldeth peaceable fruit unto them that have been exercised thereby, even the fruit of righteousness. Wherefore lift up the hands that hang down, and the palsied knees, and make straight paths for your feet. Now that's a good description of sanctification. Make straight paths for your feet. Quit walking crooked before the Lord. That that which is lame be not turned out of the way, but rather be healed. Follow after peace with all men and the sanctification without which no man shall see the Lord. Again, manifestation. Uh, look in First Thessalonians chapter 3. In verse 11, we'll find the same word, hagiosune, here. I know that many believe that they're going to fly away and be with the Lord. But if there's not some manifestation of fruit in their life, that cannot happen. If there's not a manifestation of the fruit of sanctification, which is the manifestation of sanctification, it cannot happen. Verse 11, now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way unto you. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another. Love, of course, is one of the main fruits that the Lord wants. The word agape, is, um, of course, means that you're keeping his commandments. And uh, if you do keep his commandments, Jesus said, the Father would come and make his abode with you. There's a big if there. Right? The Lord and His Father will come and make their abode with you, which means you will be the house of God if you keep His commandments, if you love Him and keep His commandments. There's a condition there. And abound in love one towards another and towards all men, even as we also towards you, to the end that you may establish your heart unblameable in holiness. And this is the word hagiosune. Again, it, it is uh, speaking of this manifestation of holiness. The manifestation of sanctification. Same word. Before our God and Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. The word saint here means sanctified ones. Who is the Lord coming with? The sanctified ones, the ones who received and bore fruit of the sanctification that was given to them at the cross. Notice he's coming with all his saints, but he's coming for some people, right? The ones who have manifested the fruit of sanctification. Once again, Jesus spoke of 30, 60, and 100 fold. And what is sanctification? What is this fruit of sanctification? Well, look at 4 and verse 1. It says, Finally then, brethren, we beseech and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, even as you do walk, that you abound more and more. For you know what charge we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. Well, the Bible says you were sanctified. But, but now he said this is the will of God. Who is he speaking to? Christians. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. He's not talking about an individual experience. He's talking about being separate from sin unto God. For well, this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that each one of you know how to possess himself of his own vessel in sanctification. What does he mean, possess himself of his own vessel? That the spiritual man, the born-again man, rule that vessel that you walk in. Possess himself of his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the passion of lust, even as the Gentiles who know not God, 
and that no man transgress and wrong his brother in the matter, because the Lord is the avenger in these things. And also we forewarned you and testify. For God called us not in uncleanness, but in sanctification. God called us not in any form of uncleanness, any form of sin. He paid the debt so that we wouldn't have to live in bondage to sin. He paid the debt so that we could accept by faith that sacrifice so that we would manifest sanctification, so that we would be servants of His. And uh, 5 and 23, too, by the way. Let me go back there and read that. 5 and 23 says, And the God of peace Himself sanctify you wholly or completely. A prayer of Paul for the Thessalonians. And the God of peace Himself sanctify you. In other words, manifest the sanctification completely. And may your spirit and soul and body be preserved entire, without blame, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it is, folks. This is not uh, under the blood. This is the blood cleansing. There's a difference. There's a blood covering for our ignorance and our foolishness and our failure. But the blood covering is just a means to an end, and that being the blood cleansing. The Bible says if we walk in the light as He is in the light, the blood of Jesus cleanses us of all unrighteousness, of all sin. If we walk in the light, we can walk in the light. We can walk in the light because Jesus crucified the old man. We are not in bondage to Him anymore. We now have our fruit unto sanctification. You know, um, we'll turn to Romans chapter 1 and verse, um, I believe it's verse 4. Let me see. Isn't it good news that you don't have to serve sin? Speaking of Jesus, it said, who was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness. What made Jesus the Son of God? The Spirit of Holiness. How can we manifest sonship without the same Spirit of Holiness? And he goes on to say, excuse me, I'm going to pull my other Bible up here a minute. By the resurrection from the dead, even Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we received grace and apostleship, Unto obedience of faith. Now, I know some of your Bibles say obedience of the faith, but actually the was added in there. There's no numeric pattern in it. And uh, also Romans 16 says the exact same thing, the obedience of faith. There is obedience of faith. People who have faith also have obedience. The ones out there that claim they don't have to obey because they have faith, these are not believers. If you believe that you're made free from sin, God gives you authority over sin. He gives you dominion over sin. Believers overcome sin. There is obedience to faith. Unto obedience of faith among all the nations for His name's sake. Among whom are ye also called to be Jesus Christ. The word called is the word Kaleho, it means invited. You are invited to be totally possessed by Jesus Christ. And verse 7, To all that are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. You say, well, David, to be was not there. That's, that's true. But if you put the word called and the word saints together, it has to be. <laughs> you know why? Because the word call means invited, and the word saints means sanctified ones. We are invited to be God's sanctified ones. You've heard that we are saints, and we are saints by faith. But if we walk by that faith, we will be saints by manifestation. So God has called us and invited us to manifest sainthood 
I was raised in the Catholic Church, of course, and um, they taught that only the most holy, the people who did miracles, of course, they don't do many miracles there, but but all of God's saints get to do miracles, you know. And uh, before they die, too, thank God, you know. Um, 1 Corinthians 1 and 2, I'm going to make this point one more time so you can see that I'm out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. Let every word be established. 1 Corinthians 1 and 2 says, Under the church of God, which is at Corinth, even them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that call upon the Lord, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in every place, their Lord and ours. We're all called to be saints. We're invited to be God's saints sanctified ones and um, of course we received this gift at the very beginning of our Christian walk one of the first things you're supposed to do saints is when you believe get baptized because that act of faith is something that you can hold on to and something you can use against the devil and um, you know as a two edged sword I want to look at Titus chapter 2 and verse 11 For the grace of God hath appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Well, do you know how the grace of God appeared? It appeared in Jesus Christ. The word appeared here is the word epiphania. It means a a, a shining forth or upon. A shining forth. It was the grace of God that shone forth out of Jesus and brought salvation to all men. But that wasn't God's plan to stop there. Okay, Jesus gave the promises. Jesus gave the sacrifice through which we put our faith in, which brings to pass the same manifestation in his people. Read on. Verse 12. Instructing us to the intent that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts Most don't even believe you have the ability to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. It's because they're not believers. You can have churches full of people that are not believers in the gospel. And they will never be overcomers. They will always be sinners, quote, saved by grace, warming church pews, and never overcoming and never walking as disciples of Jesus Christ because they do not believe the real gospel. They're deceived. Verse 12, instructing us to the intent that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. No, God didn't provide holiness in the hereafter when you don't have any flesh. God provided holiness now, here and now, to live godly and righteously in this present world. But if you don't believe the gospel, you will not be able to do it. You'd better find out what the gospel is because very few churches preach it. Verse 13, looking for the blessed hope. The word hope here means um, a firm expectation. In other words, They're looking forward to what's been promised. Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of the great God, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The appearing here is, again, the same word, the epiphania, a shining forth from. We're looking... They saw, the apostles saw in their day, the epiphany manifested in Jesus Christ when he brought God's salvation. Now, we have this firm expectation of seeing this again. No, it's not talking about Jesus coming in the sky. We know he's coming in the sky. But that's another word, perusia. This is the word epiphania. And this word means his shining forth out of you. The shining forth of his glory out of you. Verse 14. 
who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. That he might redeem us from all iniquity. Now some say, well, that's just what was happened, what happened in um, in heavenly places, and that um, we don't ever expect to see that. Well, well, that would make God a total failure, wouldn't it? Since he wanted to redeem us from all iniquity, why would we want to continue to live in it? Or why would we expect that he wouldn't expect that what he spoke would come to pass? And purify unto himself a people for his own possession, zealous of good works. Purify a people to possess who are zealous of good works. So you see, he's talking about the here and now, the manifestation, the appearing of Jesus in his people here and now. That's his plan. That's what sanctification is all about. This is what we're supposed to be believing for. Holding fast the confession of our hope that it waver not. What did he call it? The appearing of the glory of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The epiphany of the glory of our great God, Jesus Christ. Where is that glory? Well, if you look in um, Colossians, we see once again in uh, chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, If then you were raised together with Christ, the Bible says that Christ caused us to be seated with Him in heavenly places. We've already overcome the world, folks. By the sacrifice of Jesus, we're already sanctified. We're already perfected. If then you were raised together with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated on the right hand of God. The Bible says, even as he is, even so are we in this world. Even as he is. Romans 6, did you notice that when you go down in baptism, you're dead. But when you come up out of the waters, he lives. He lives. Not as he was in this world, folks, as he is now. The resurrected Christ lives in us. Some people think that's just a neat saying. No, it's a, it's a two-edged sword that we're supposed to use on our enemies. So... Seek the things that are above where Christ is seated on the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things that are above and not on the things that are upon the earth. Set your mind. What do we have in heavenly places? Jesus said, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God's will will be done through those who pray and believe such prayers. Verse 3, For you died, and your life is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, shall be manifested. That is the word phaniru. It comes from out of the word epiphany. And it means to make visible. When Christ, who is our life, shall be made visible in us. Wow. Then shall we also with him be manifested in glory. You see, when Christ is manifested in us, that's the glory. That's the glory he was talking about in Titus. The glory of God by epiphany in us. The shining forth of the glory of God. What is the glory? We discovered that it was the manifestation of sonship, the manifestation of uh, sanctification or holiness. That's the glory. In the spirit realm, it shines out of us. No, most men don't get to see it. I have known men that have seen it. I have seen it. It actually does shine out of people. Glory to God. Lord bless you, saints. information and materials, 
go to www.americaslastdays.com.